actually explaining when I was back there. I was like, that's going to be hard. He's <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I work. <laughs> it's good as long as you share. Get my good side. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going without yes. notes? No, I have them on my phone. Oh, okay. My, um, <laughs> well, because she sent it to me <clears throat> first thing this morning. And you can and print I want to make out. sure I use the updated version. Yeah, yeah so, no, I, uh, I, so I, didn't I didn't have any way to print it. I suppose there was a business center here, but I just Well, didn't. and I printed it before I left, but I, of course, sent it to the non-color printer. So all of my uh, greens <laughs> just showed up as very light gray. It wasn't going to work well anyway. <laughs> yeah. So this worked out perfect. Yeah. Okay, ladies, I think we're about ready to get started. <clears throat> Hello again. Welcome back to our second panel of the morning. Really quick, as a matter of housekeeping, before we jump into the substance of the panel, I just want to remind everybody that we do have an app for this conference, as we have in past years. Um, it can be downloaded from Cvent. If you did not do that before you got here today, there's actually a QR code outside on the registration desk uh, where you can just scan it real quick and download it. The uh, reason why that's helpful is any last minute um, room changes, which we won't have much of at this point, but um, or changes for <laughs> the events that we have off site later today, we can push notifications through that app to let everybody know about those changes. It's also got the contact information for all of the attendees. If you're trying to meet up with anybody later on to go to dinner or to do something through NCBJ, that's a really easy way to communicate with folks. Uh, to see the speaker bios, uh, to get information about the presentations that you've heard this morning. So you'll want to make sure if you haven't downloaded that app that you do that so you have access to all that information. Um, I also wanted to take an opportunity really quick to thank our sponsors. The folks who sponsor iWork are the ones who allow us to put on conferences like this and bring the programming and everything else that we try to bring to everybody. We couldn't do it without them. Um, our titanium sponsors this year are Alix Partners, Glass Americas, and Pachulski, Stang, Zeal, and Jones. We really appreciate their sponsorship of this organization and helping us to bring the content to everyone. Uh, our diamond sponsors are Alvarez and Marshall, Grant Thornton, and Prime Clerk. Our platinum sponsors are BMC Group, C 
CR3 Partners, FTI Consulting, Getzler Henrich, Lowenstein Sandler, PwC Canada, Price Waterhouse, uh, SCNH Capital, Secor Law. Our gold sponsors are Baker Hostetler, Force 10 Partners, Jones Walker, Keen Summit, Miller Canfield, and SM Financial Services Corporation. Last but not least, our silver sponsors are Baker Tilly, Barron Business Consulting, Bucalter, Development Specialists Inc., Godfrey and Kahn, Goodwin, Mackinac, Riker Danzig, Steichman Elliott, <coughs> Thornton, Grout, and Finnegan, Troutman Pepper, and Tucker Arsenberg. Uh, again, uh, we thoroughly appreciate what all of those companies bring to the table in terms of their sponsorship and with all of you ladies out there who are affiliated with those folks and helped us secure those sponsorships. We appreciate that very much. Okay, let's get into our second panel. Uh, 2020 ended with a record number of retail bankruptcies. We had 35 retailers and over 12,000 store closures. We haven't had numbers like that ever. The focus of today's panel is why. What led to those filings? What issues have arisen as a result? And what do the experts on this stage today think it means going forward? Speaking of those experts, we have uh, immediately to my left, Kristen Burgers. She's a partner at Hersher Fleischer, am I saying yes. that right? <laughs> All right, in Tyson's, Virginia, which is just outside Washington, D.C. She represents business debtors, creditors, trustees, and committees in reorganizations, liquidations, financial workouts, and dissolutions with a special emphasis in retail bankruptcies, the sale and financing of shopping centers, hotels, and mixed-use developments in the D.C. metro area and nationally, and leveraging new financing vehicles like property-assessed clean energy. Some of her past cases include Pier One, Lehman Brothers, and Green Tech Automotive. Immediately to her left is Jill Nolan Snyder. Jill's a member of Frost Brown Todd in their Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania office. She focuses on bankruptcy and commercial litigation, specifically restructuring, foreclosures, receiverships, and loan workouts. Her clients include financial institutions, distressed debt investors, private equity funds, special servicers, public utilities, equipment lessors, and commercial landlords and tenants, giving her a uniquely broad perspective of commercial real estate cases from almost every side. Finally, on the Zoom, we have Diana Peterson. Diana is the president and CEO of AW Properties Global, a national real estate consulting brokerage and auction firm she founded in Northbrook, Illinois. As an attorney, real estate broker, and auctioneer, she has 24 years experience in commercial real estate leasing and sales. Throughout her career, she's sold assets worth hundreds of millions through both negotiated sales and auctions. She's advised clients on liquidation matters across many industries and has extensive experience in the sale of all asset classes. Her clients include financial institutions, special servicers, private equity funds, restructuring firms, and commercial property owners nationwide. She's frequently brought into a matter by attorneys and restructuring professionals when commercial or residential real estate is involved. So we have a broad range of perspectives this morning to tell us what's going on with commercial real estate and where we're headed from here. So to start out, let's um, kind of take a 40,000 foot view of what happened and how we got here. So as everybody knows, um, retail has been having issues for years. There's always the discussion of what is the future of retail? What are star stores going to look like? Do people still want to go to brick and mortar stores? Are the costs of leases worth it? All of those issues have been bubbling in the background for years. And then along comes COVID. And with COVID, um, retail, of course, was one of the, the primary, um, I don't know, victims maybe for, for, for not a very good word since we're talking about a health crisis, but, but certainly retail suffered and that stores had to be closed. There were state mandates that mandated that, that stores had to be closed for a period of time. Um, people, when they did reopen, of course, we, we've heard about some staffing issues. <laughs> the staffing was difficult. Um, people were not comfortable going out to stores. All of those things sort of cascaded in the background um, and really caused a, a major um, impact on retail that, that probably was in the works for a period of time. As we all know, there was legislation that was passed in order to help um, 
not just retail, but but all of the commercial real estate space. Um, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which was passed in March of 2020, um, which did, among other things, allow some some concessions in in how we treated leases and the requirement that lease payments be made under the bankruptcy code, and of course extended or or increased the ceiling um, for the Small Business Reorganization Act from roughly 2.7 million of debt to 7.5 million of debt. <clears throat> and then finally, um, in March, when it was apparent that, that things were not going to, um, to go back to normal anytime soon, and maybe that there wouldn't be a normal as we used to know it, there was the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which continued the protections of the CARES Act to 20, March of 2022. So that's sort of a, a backdrop of, of what has happened, and, and I know we're going to get into the bankruptcy code and some of the bigger retail cases that occurred thereafter. If you could point to one common theme <clears throat> or strategy in those retail cases, what would it be? I would say that the most prominent issue in those cases was definitely the restructuring of the leases. Um, in my career, I've probably done more lease restructuring work in the last 18 months than I've done in the last 16 years. It, it was almost from the get-go, you know, some of our clients, we represent a lot of companies that are either in property ownership or management, a lot of malls um, and other retail type establishments. Even before the cases were filing, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, the restructuring people that they had hired, <clears throat> excuse me, were calling asking to renegotiate the lease before the petition was even filed in some cases. We saw a lot of different types of restructuring. There was a lot of rent abatement, maybe for those uh, first few months when the world shut down starting in March of 2020. Uh, we also saw different you know, ways that the monthly payments would be reduced, uh, you know, some of the CAM charges may have been pushed to the end of the lease, but in general, and in speaking about commercial real estate issues in light of the coronavirus, my experience has been almost exclusively with leasing and retail. As a sub five trustee, I'm seeing a lot of smaller restaurants and food service related companies filing sub chapter five cases including ones that are located in shopping centers and other multi-use uh, retail spaces. The main benefits they're trying to utilize are the automatic stay coupled with the immediate appointment of a facilitator and a subchapter five trustee, um, <clears throat> the uh, streamlined filing requirements, the ability to restructure a lien on a homestead if the loan was business related, um, and the lack of UST fees and, and attempting to keep those fees down. How has subchapter five played into your caseloads, if at all? So it's interesting, I had one of the, um, if not the first, a subchapter five filed in the Western District of Virginia, and nobody knew how it worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's also so, a common thing. <laughs> so in that case, um, there were multiple, the, it was like there was no communication between the clerk's office and judge's chambers. So the judge would issue an order setting the deadlines, the abbreviated deadlines in subchapter five, and then the clerk's office would issue a notice that conflicted with the judge's order. Um, and so it really sort of resulted in chaos. And, and the case involved, it was an individual that owned a motorcycle repair shop. Um, ultimately, the case ended up being kicked out for reasons that had, had nothing to do with subchapter five. Um, but it was just interesting to see how it, how it initially got used. Um, since that time, I've been involved in a handful of them, and, and my partner is a Subchapter 5 trustee, and it's a wonderful tool for people who fit into that niche of their, where their, um, you know, their debt load is not so, so high. Maybe they have one location, maybe they have a few locations, um, and they really have a lot of leverage that they wouldn't <laughs> otherwise have. Um, and of course, the, the fact that there's a subchapter five trustee involved to mediate some of the issues is really helpful because 
and particularly I found in smaller cases, if it's just adversarial, sometimes you're just spinning your wheels. You're having the same fight you had prior to bankruptcy in the bankruptcy court. So I don't know, Jill, have you had? Any I have there? not had a lot of experience with subchapter five cases. Where I'm located in the Western District of Pennsylvania, um, I believe we've probably have had maybe between 10 and 20 filed, and I have not really been involved in any of them. And the few that I have touched on, just knowing about them, or I know some of the subchapter five trustees, didn't involve real estate. Right. So in our, our larger chapter 11, so I just wanna <coughs> you know, run, talk about that for a minute Please. so we sort of set the background. Mm -hmm. Um, if everyone thinks back to, gosh, a year and a half ago now, it's hard to believe, um, February of 2020, in, in my area, in the Eastern District of Virginia, Pier 1 had filed for bankruptcy. They filed for Chapter 11. They came in and said, we're going to reorganize, we're going to shrink our footprint, we're going to boost our online sales, and we're going to get out of this thing a bigger, better Pier 1, um, which all sounded great right? That's usually the same message everybody has when they file for, for cases or the same public message that comes out with these large chapter 11s. And then, of course, coronavirus hits, states have their mandates, everybody has to shut down. Um, so Pier 1 went back to the bankruptcy court. Pier 1 actually had, I should give a little more background, they, they had um, filed a motion to, to sell. They were also trying to sell, and that was part of their deal with their secured lender. So on the day that they were supposed to come in and report to the court what happened in their auction and get their order, they came in and said, you know, wait a minute. This is not going to work the way that we thought it was going to work. Things have changed. The landscape has changed. And we want to, um, what we now you know, it's become part of the bankruptcy <clears throat> jargon. We want to put this case on ice. We want to put a stop to everything. We're going to adjourn the proceedings. We want to not pay rent for a while. And we want to come back in a couple months and see how this goes. Um, and it was at, at that time, I guess Models had been the first one um, to go into court with that relief. But it, it was big news in our area and sort of, sort of a novel you know, just yet another sign that this was the end of the world and, and things right. were going really bad. Um, in the Eastern District of Virginia, there already had been um, not necessarily precedent for putting cases on ice, but there had been a key decision that in the Circuit City case um, in 2009, I believe, that came from Judge Hennikins, the same judge who was hearing the Pier 1 case. And in Circuit City, Judge Hennikins had made really sort of a novel ruling at the time, that stub rent, that, that period of rent from the time that you, the rent is, the rent is due um, after bankruptcy is an administrative claim that doesn't have to be paid with super priority. It doesn't have to be paid up front. It can wait until the end of the case, be paid with, with all the other admin claims. That, that sort of gave Pier 1 an opening to say, we're already doing this for stub rent. Let's just do it for the other rent. Um, and they found a friendly audience in Judge Hennikins, and he, he agreed that the, the times were unique and it cost, created a need for unique <laughs> relief. Um, and he actually allowed them to basically suspend proceedings, any creditor actions, the debtor could still keep working, which was um, sort of its own controversy, from March through, through the end of May. So really a, a three-month period. Um, and, and it's interesting to note, so that sort of set the tone. We also had the Models case, which did the same thing, suspending their case basically from March 27th to June 15th. And all of that seemed to be a trend until Chuck E. Cheese was filed in Texas. And the judge in Texas said, hey, I can only do what the bankruptcy code says I can do. And 365D3 says 60 days. So that's, that is the most rent deferral that you're going to get. Um, and after 60 days, you have to start paying. So with that background, people started to shift what they were doing and started to react differently um, and take different approaches to cases. And with that, I, I think um, 
it might be appropriate maybe to, to talk a little bit. I know, Jill, you do a lot of um, actions that are not just bankruptcy, but receiverships and, right. and out of court. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, and also with respect to the Chuck E. Cheese case before we leave that, I mean, I think it was very interesting to see the different perspectives of the two judges as, you know, in Virginia, they were like, yes, this is a pandemic. This is extraordinary circumstances. Yes, we can do this. And in Texas, the judge was like, no, we have to follow the bankruptcy code. And the interest, I wasn't involved in the Pier 1 case as much as I was involved in the Chuck E. Cheese case. And I will say that the restructuring people that were involved in the Chuck E. Cheese case were hustlers. They were out there. They were, you know, while these motions were pending, they were out there. They were restructuring these leases. I mean, they, they were really on top of their game such that when the court finally adjudicated the motion for the rent abatement, they had already renegotiated their leases with like 90% of their constituents. Um, I think there was only a few um, holdouts on those leases. So that was, that was very interesting to see. But in terms of you know, <clears throat> what's going on outside of bankruptcy, I do a lot of commercial foreclosure work and receiverships. Um, and with respect to those two areas of law during this pandemic, they've been extremely slow. I can tell you that I got my first referral from a bank for a commercial foreclosure last month, and that was the first one I had gotten in over a year. I mean, the banks aren't really putting the pressure on people to do anything. Um, a lot of you know what I'm seeing are foreclosures involving acquisition loans. You know, someone bought an old building, they want to restructure it somehow or repurpose it somehow. Then COVID hit. Now we're in a situation, as our first panel described, where we're having these supply issues and the cost of lumber and the cost of steel are going up. Um, so, so that's becoming more problematic for these people that are in the commercial real estate market who have you know, acquired these buildings and they want to repurpose them. Now they can't get the construction loans to do that. And even when they can get the construction loans to do that, their initial budgets are completely different than what they thought they were. I actually, I have a case right now where we have um, a loan and I, I represent the bank and there was a mechanics lien filed against the borrower because they had bought a million dollars worth of steel because they were gonna repurpose this building and turn it into something different. And it actually worked out to their benefit because they bought the steel two years ago and now they're going to get the construction loan and take my client out and they're in a much better position because the million dollars worth of steel that they have sitting at their facility is now would probably cost them $2 million on the market. So, so that's just, you know, something interesting that I've been seeing and kind of ties, you know, what they were talking about on our first panel and with what we're talking about now. Um, some of the other things I'm seeing outside of bankruptcy are constitutional challenges. Uh, you know, when we're foreclosing or when we're trying to evict commercial tenants, uh, they're coming back with these constitutional challenge arguments saying that the government shut down orders or takings. I mean, I can only speak from my experience in Pennsylvania, um, but in Pennsylvania, I had a case where we were trying to evict a tenant. They had... Um, if anybody's familiar with them, they're called the escape rooms. They're kind of like these, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of, you know, they're anything from like having fun to like team building exercises, that sort of stuff. But um, so we were attempting to evict them and they came back and said, no, 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 you can't evict us for non-payment of rent. We didn't have to pay you rent because the government shutdown orders constituted a taking. Uh, the in the theory behind that being that the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has the power of eminent domain. The government orders, you know, shutting down businesses or limiting the use of property, um, <clears throat> those types of things interfered with the tenant's right to enjoyment of the property. And therefore, because the Commonwealth shut down those rights and shut down their ability to use the property, it constituted a taking under the Constitution. Now, the case law on that issue suggests that that's not correct, that it, it does not constitute a taking. However, most recently, if I have the date, it was September 13th, um, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania struck down our governor's order, shutting all the businesses down and finding it unconstitutional. So I think that we're going to see a lot more litigation on that topic. 
um, because it really, I mean, it was almost like a ripple effect. I mean, if you shut your business down, how are you going to get the income to pay your lenders? So for the most part, I think the lenders worked with people. Um, I know, you know, from my clients that lenders were doing anything from deferring payments to the end of the lease to letting them use um, tax and insurance escrow reserves to pay principal and interest payments. But really, I mean, it, it was really tough out there for those particular industries, your hotels, your restaurants, to get the funds together to make those payments. But other than that, I haven't, I've not seen a lot of receivership work come out of the pandemic. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the banks are just kind of waiting and seeing what's gonna happen at this point. Diana, how are you seeing um, folks making lemonade out of the lemons of this pandemic? Well, our firm, um, as you mentioned at the at the top of the hour, our firm um, handles the sale of all asset classes of commercial real estate um, through traditional sales, um, 363 sales, auctions of all kinds. Um, and so we really have a sort of finger on the pulse of commercial real estate, all asset classes at any given time, uh, because we are selling all asset classes uh, regularly. And I will say that industrial has definitely been the winner um, during COVID. Um, you know, obviously retail already had the apocalypse before COVID and that's just deepened um, the pain for, for retail property owners. But industrial has really had a huge uptick um, and it already started pre-COVID due to e-commerce, uh, but with COVID, you know, the need for e-commerce has been even greater with people at home. Um, so, you know, we uh, have a number of industrial listings at any given time. I might get 10 inquiries a day on an industrial listing where I'd be lucky to get 10 inquiries in a month on a retail listing. Um, and there's a, a clamoring for industrial right now. Um, we actually just closed on a sale in um, Indiana uh, that was referred to us by an equipment liquidator um, and the buyer of that property. It was 29 acres and um, 650,000 square feet. The buyer of the property is redeveloping it as a distribution center and data center. Um, so we are seeing distribution center needs, um, driving industrial uh, data center needs obviously are, are up even more than they were before COVID. Um, and then also the cannabis industry, um, as you may have uh, read in the news, I think um, it's being reported that, um, that people are consuming more alcohol during COVID. Well, I think they're definitely consuming more cannabis as well uh, because we are seeing a, a huge um, um, surge in interest in our industrial properties for that use as well. Um, and it's reminiscent of when um, the self-storage uh, was such a big um, sort of new thing in commercial real estate a few years ago where you, know, you had all these people competing uh, for spaces. Well, cannabis is just like that. The self-storage guys would pay way more for an asset than anyone else in the marketplace. The same with the cannabis people. So uh, industrial is really the, the darling right now. Um, and, you know, anyone who is selling industrial real estate um, and regularly is, is happy to be in that business um, versus retailer office. Diana, one of the things we're seeing, um, or at least I'm seeing in Virginia in my real estate practice, <clears throat> is sort of the idea of the demand for, in particular, warehouse space and for, um, for data centers. So it's really driving up, not just driving up prices, but it's making prices crazy. Mm -hmm. So in um, suburban DC, what was farmland that, and not and by suburban, I mean like 65 to 75 miles out. Um, what was farmland that might have sold for $5,000 an acre, I get contracts to review for $900,000 wow. an acre. Are mm -hmm. you seeing that kind of across the board in your area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if the land is, is you know, zoned properly or can be rezoned um, for that use, um, definitely um, land prior to COVID was the hardest asset class to sell. Um, in particular, because of retail, there were so many assets that could be redeveloped uh, that there was little interest in, in new construction 
Um, but now, um, in these cases, definitely, it's increased the price of, of certain pieces of land based on their location. But the sheer number of retail bankruptcies in 2021, there has to be a lot of vacant retail space. What are y'all seeing landlords doing trying to mitigate damages? Well, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is a lot of that abandoned retail space being repurposed into different things. Um, I had a client that, uh, what was it? It was the Craftworks bankruptcy case. They had a Logan's Steakhouse, which is one of the, it's, I've never been to a Logan Steakhouse, so I'm not exactly sure what it's like, but from what I understand, it's a freestanding building, um, similar, you know, has its own design. And at the end of that, when they rejected the lease, Amazon came in and took over the property and now uses it as like locker and warehouse space. So I'm seeing a lot of that sort of things, like what were restaurants, um, what were primarily the restaurants actually, is the restaurants are being repurposed into different things. I had another case where they had a restaurant and once that lease was rejected, Trader Joe's came in and wanted to put a Trader Joe's in that space. So I'm seeing, you know, the old retail and the old restaurants being turned into uh, more warehouse space and even more so more grocery space. I mean, with what has happened in the pandemic with respect to, I mean, Walmart and Target and even Giant Eagles, like the big grocery store where we live, um, you know, the, the shopping for you, the instant pickup, the home delivery. I mean, that requires them to have space to prepare those items to either deliver to you or for you to pick up. Um, and then I think also a lot of it has to do, or I guess a lot of what I'm also seeing with it is that these retailers that are surviving, just by way of example, like in the Chuck E. Cheese case, um, they have completely shifted the way that they do things. Uh, for example, in Chuck E. Cheese, what they did is as soon as they filed bankruptcy, they started their own um, like food delivery service. It's called Pasquale's Pizza so that they could compete with the other restaurants out there that were doing that. Um, having mobile apps so you could order through Grubhub and all these different vendors that will deliver the food right to you. Um, and just by way of a little trivia, Pasquale was the chef in the robotic band for Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Robot. um, and it would be so awesome if when they delivered their pizza, they had like a mobile ski ball. That I know. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I keep bringing up the Chuck E. Cheese thing because I have a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. So Chuck E. Cheese was a place that we spent a lot of time. <laughs> and, you know, when it was shut down and we'd drive by it, my kids were like, Chuck E. Cheese, Chuck E. Cheese. And I'm like, I don't know, guys. I don't know if it's coming back. But it did because they were able to, and, and, that's, and that's part of the repurpose. So some of the Chuck E. Cheese restaurants that they shut down, they then utilized for their mobile food and mobile delivery services. So that's just a little bit of what I'm seeing. I mean, I know Diana and Kristen, you're probably seeing things that are a little similar um, in different aspects. Yeah, definitely grocery anchored centers are, are doing better um, than those that are not grocery anchored. Um, we've also seen a, a lot of, um, again, this sort of goes to like, you know, the, the sins that, that people are committing more, um, at least in my view, it um, could be categorized that way. We've seen a big uptick in gaming uh, facilities um, where, you know, what was a, a restaurant or some other form of retail is now um, a site for gaming. Um, there seems to be a lot of that going on. I don't know if that reflects all these people out there collecting unemployment instead of going back to their gig worker job. Um, but uh, gaming seems to be um, surging um, as a redevelopment opportunity for retail. What about hotel conversions? Have any of you see, seen hotel properties that aren't able to continue working repurposed into, for example, um, housing, apartments, condos, things like that? Absolutely. Um, so we, uh, we, we've sold a lot of senior living facilities and we're um, networked in with a lot of the people who buy those assets. Um, and they're typically going to look at a hotel, um, you know, as a possible conversion to senior living. Um, you know, typically the zoning will already allow it. Um, the biggest issues are, are typically the width of the hallways. Um, so a hotel can be a good uh, senior housing conversion opportunity. 
Um, it could also be multifamily apartments um, or student housing. Um, you know, so that's, you know, that's what we've been seeing. Um, again, you know, you, you have to make sure that the zoning allows it and that the, the property itself lends itself to that sort of reuse. So when I'm, I haven't seen um, necessarily a hotel being repurposed, but one of the examples I, I'd like to give of repurposing local to our area, there is a mall, Dulles Town Center. It was built in 1999, so relatively new, sort of a premier property when it was um, first built. It was 1.4 million square feet with 160 retail and restaurant spaces. And the anchor store as well, um, you'll know where the sto story is going as soon as I tell you who the anchors were, Nordstrom, Lord & Taylor, and Sears, <laughs> so, so yeah, that was not, it might have been a recipe for success in 1999, not so much later. Um, the, the, the tax assessments of the mall sort of tell a story. Um, when it was built, actually not when it was built, so it was built in 1999. 2008, it, the tax assessment was 300 million. 2018, the tax assessment was 183.6 million. And then in 2020, the tax assessment was $55 million. It went into foreclosure of October 2020. Um, I went there for dinner the other night because the GCK factory is still open. It's like a ghost town. They still have the carousel on the second floor that just spins around with nobody on it. <laughs> it's really bizarre. Um, but the, the purchasers are private equity, and they um, have not yet started the rezoning process, but they're sort of starting the public relations campaign that will precede the rezoning process. And they um, would like to repurpose the mall and have it be a hotel, some apartments, grocery store, limited retail, and green space. So they're sort of taking that multi-use development, mixed use, um, retail and residential concept, but sort of putting it all under one roof, um, which will be fascinating if they can, if they can pull it off. I, I don't know if our local authorities are, are receptive to that or not, but it'll be interesting to see. One other thing that I'm seeing, at least in the short term, is they're using the vacant retail space for COVID related testing. Um, you know, where I live, as soon as the sign march shut down, it immediately became a COVID-19 testing place. Um, and we're seeing that more and more. Well, we were seeing it more and more. Now it's starting to go away. But with the Delta variant, it's starting to come back again. They are starting to use these vacant, mostly in the strip mall type uh, real estate sector that they're coming in and having the testing facilities, um, even temporarily, but just thought that was interesting because it is something that is derived directly out of this. So I actually got this as an aside, <clears throat> but it's kind of funny. I got my COVID shots in an old um, green top, which mm -hmm. was a hunting and fishing store. So I, I actually got my COVID shot in the fishing <laughs> department and then I had to go to the hunting department to wait my 15 minutes. Yeah. They still had all the signs up. They still had like the taxidermy animals. It oh, was yeah. very bizarre. Yeah, it's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> mm. Okay, so as the retail world continues to adjust to this new normal, what are y'all seeing in terms of lease terms? What specific issues are you having to contend with in recent cases? It, well, in my experience, you know, one thing, probably the biggest thing is how do we deal with a pandemic going forward? Um, a lot of the lease negotiations are, you know, surrounding what happens if the government shuts us down again. Um, you know, people are getting creative. You know, sometimes the landlords are offering an abatement for a couple months. Um, you know, maybe the first couple months is on you. This next couple months is on us. But it really just depends on a state by state basis because it depends on what the states are going to do. So it's, it's, it's hard to plan for that when you have a client who's leasing properties all across the United States and trying to make things as uniform as possible. Um, but that is one thing in particular. And then another thing also um, is the health and safety protocols, which is not really something that I had seen in leases before. Um, but because of the issues with the violations for not following the government mandates and whatnot, 
they are putting more language in the leases, um, not necessarily requiring masks or, you know, hand sanitizers or anything like that, but more so, um, you know, it may be a breach of the lease if you don't follow the health and safety mandates imposed by the, you know, particular government in your area or something along those lines. Those are two things, two new things that I'm really seeing more so than anything else. So I think in my practice, the, the, and this sort of ties into what we were hearing earlier um, in the presentation on, on supply issues, force majeure um, causes and um, delays caused, to supply, caused by supply issues mm -hmm. are, are two of the provisions that I find that I am negotiating the hardest at this point. Um, typically, I'm, I'm representing tenants and we don't want force majeure to be to be so broad. We don't want it to include supply shortages. <laughs> like we get now, everybody's putting pandemics in their force majeure. Okay, we see that, we understand that. But now we're adding supply shortages, labor sh shortages. Um, I was just actually doing a, a have ongoing right now a build to suit lease, which of course is going to be particularly dependent and the time frame dependent on um, supply and labor supply of materials and labor and we're actually negotiating things like if the tenant requests a material that is not reasonably commercially available then any delay caused by that will be will be a factor that pushes into the rent commencement date right and we want to say hey we're, we're not going to start paying rent until this building is done and we can move in and the landlord is saying, hey, if you want a material that we can't get, then you're going to have to start paying rent and you're just going to have to wait for that material. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a really tough negotiation. I, I don't know what the answer is or how that's going to come out. And I know, Diana, I'm sure you, you've been involved from your side on things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned force majeure clauses, um, and I started my career after I uh, quit practicing law in 1997 um, and happily moved into the world of real estate and business, um, I started my career as a tenant rep um, with Jones Lang LaSalle representing United Healthcare um, Group across the country, United Health Group. And I was negotiating their leases, you know, finding their space, and we would have these 160, 180 page leases um, and I remember the force majeure clause always just being something we never even touched. Um, even the attorneys that were working hand in hand with us, um, you know, didn't make any changes to the force majeure clause. And so I do think uh, that's a huge um, sea change, you know, that's been caused by the COVID situation. And um, I know we even had a, a law firm in Chicago that had, um, you know, very heavily negotiated their force majeure clause, you know, much to their benefit during COVID. Um, but I do see that as the probably the biggest um, change going forward based on my uh, past experience. Um, also in retail, you know, what we've seen is some of the uh, landlords have been giving more of a relief on the base rent. Um, but taking a larger share in percentage rent um, so that when the retailer does recover, uh, the landlord is, is going to see um, more uh, coming in more quickly that way. So a percentage rent based on the, the profits, the retail sales. Um, so that's been a way that some retail landlords have been able to, um, you know, give a little now, but hopefully get a lot more back um, than they would have in the past. Sounds like a creative solution. And it kind of dovetails back into, you know, it seems like before this pandemic, we saw a lot more hard line, you know, in commercial real estate cases from landlords on rents, you know, especially after a bankruptcy case was filed. But to the point that they were making earlier in the supply chain presentation, people are having to work together now, because if you're just going to take a hard line, you're going to cause that whole house of cards to fall and it ultimately affects your bottom line. And so it, it, people are being more cooperative that they're seeing. And I think it's the same way really in this space, you know, whereas landlords might not have had, they, they might've held all the cards previously and, and been able to exert that leverage. It really, we're entering a time where there's a lot more cooperative type of interaction mm -hmm. because there has to be, that's the only way that the industry can, can stay alive and everybody can make money. 
Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, where do you guys, you know, look at your crystal ball <laughs> and guess? <laughs> and most of the guesses we've made in the last year and a half have not worked out exactly the way we thought, um, to Cheryl's point. But if you're looking at your crystal ball and guessing based on your current practice where you think commercial real estate cases are headed, do you think we're going to see another just banner year in 2021, maybe even in 2022? Um, do you see that some of these creative solutions may reduce the number of filings and make it easier for people to work things out outside of bankruptcy? What do all three of you see in terms of what you expect? Well, I think that um, obviously the, the initial wave of bankruptcies has subsided. Um, I don't anticipate that there's going to be another big wave. And I think that is because retailers have adapted, um, that they have not just um, figured out ways to negotiate with their landlords, but they've also are sort of adapting their models and figuring out what they need to do to be more nimble and to be more responsive to the way that people are shopping and doing things right now. So I think that's going to be more things like um, more options to buy online or pick up in the store, more options to um, go to the store and, and physically see things and be able to touch things, but not pick it up that day. Um, one of the t things that I noticed over the weekend, I was at William Sonoma buying a, a wedding gift for somebody. And I could see the things that were on the registry and I could order, but I couldn't pick it up, um, which was kind of bad because I was out of time. So, <laughs> so I had to put yeah. the note that you will be receiving this in, in the mail. So <laughs> congratulations, happy wedding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, I think what we're gonna see is, is just a more nimble retail market space. And, um, and I think smaller stores, I, I definitely think the, the era of the large department stores is, is probably um, come and gone other than for the Walmarts or the Targets that have not just clothing, but they have, have all sorts of different goods and you're going sort of one-stop shopping. Yeah. No, and I, things you can grab that day. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, and I agree with you, Kristen. I think, you know, at the, at the beginning of 2021, there were a few big retail filings, but it's kind of fallen off ever since that. I think in the commercial real estate space, in terms of bankruptcies and what we'll see, it'll be more related to the construction and the development of real estate. Um, again, tying back to the supply chain issues, uh, people that are in the you know construction and development sector for commercial real estate are going to have issues getting the materials that they need and getting them at the prices they can afford. Um, I know just by way of example, where I live there, I, I, my subdivision was built on a farm and slowly over the years, the farmer would sell pieces of land to different developers. Well, the farmer finally died this last year and the property didn't even go on the market. They sold it to a developer almost immediately. Actually, I'm sorry, this was two years ago. So they sold the land to the developer immediately and all the developer has done is essentially the earthwork. They've like laid the utilities and put in the sewer lines and all that stuff, but they are not building, they're not selling lots, they're not doing anything because the cost of constructing these homes is so expensive right now um, that even for the astronomical prices that they wanna charge for these homes, they just, they can't do it. So I think that we will see more commercial real estate bankruptcies as it relates to issues with the supply chain as well. So I think the two will tie together hand in hand in the future. Diana, what do you think? Well, I think uh, the words that come to mind um, for property owners and landlords um, going forward um, is flexibility and creativity. I, I think uh, landlords and, and commercial real estate owners have had to be um, both flexible and creative. Um, you know, through this crisis and, and coming out of it, uh, we'll have to continue uh, to do the same. Um, I think that there are a lot of um, office uh, property owners that are really struggling, um, you know, with, you know, paying the taxes and, and the upkeep on properties where the rents are so reduced. Um, I think that there's a lot of private equity money uh, that is going to uh, be snapping up 
um, office properties, hotel properties, uh, malls, um, you know, eventually things turn around um, and uh, people can, uh, you know, do these readaptive really uses. Um, so I think flexibility, creativity, and there's a ton of money that was sitting on the sidelines that's starting to be deployed. So. You mentioned, Kristen, that, you know, retail is adapting and they're figuring out different ways to, you know, structure their business models that uh, make it more conducive to a pandemic or, or something else that happens that might um, might shut things down. One of the most interesting phenomenons there, I think, is this concept of the virtual fitting rooms <laughs> with retail. Oh, yes. um, and I don't know how big stores are doing it. I haven't had any experience there, but I've seen that there are a ton of things pop websites, you know, Facebook based or whatever popping mm -hmm. up. I don't know. I'm interested to see if anybody else in the room has seen it where you've got a few ladies that are all different sizes and they're trying on all the clothes and they're telling you, you know, I'm a size 10 and it fits this way across my hips and you want to order big or you want to order small or, you know, it really is a neat way to see somebody kind of giving you all the things that you would try to do if you were in a fitting room. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that's one of the most interesting things to me um, is because you say virtual fitting room and you think, golly, how's that going to work? Right. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not really, <laughs> you know, thanks, but, uh, you know, that's not, and so um, I've also noticed too that a lot of the places that I order from have gotten much um, easier return policies and things oh, yes. like that to allow you. But on the flip side of that, fewer places want to allow returns, you know. And then there's the the shipping to get it back, which is not real reliable right now. And so yeah. it just seems like one solution just sometimes leads into Do more problems, problem. yeah. you know, that have Absolutely. to be have to be troubleshooted. We do have a few more minutes left if anybody has any questions uh, of these panelists. I'd be curious to know too what everybody else is seeing. I mean, in terms of commercial real estate and bankruptcy in your areas, is it is everybody primarily working on retail cases or are there other issues that are arising in the context of commercial real estate transactions or bankruptcy? So, um, For Diana and those on the Zoom, she was saying that her company is seeing less lease negotiation and more disposition and, and repurposing um, work at this point, kind of indicating a shift, you know, from one to the other. Um, I'll tell you, I don't, I've, I haven't typically done a whole lot of single asset real estate cases in my career, but I've had a couple of those pop up in the last year, and I'm in a much smaller market um, in the Panhandle of Florida and in South Alabama. Um, but I've got, I've got a single asset real estate case right now in Panama City <clears throat> where it was an apartment complex um, that due to hurricane damage had some, some problems, needed uh, significant renovations, ended up with a, um, a contractor that wasn't licensed and they didn't figure it out until uh -oh. it was always in with some things. But a lot of just factors that led to not being able to pay the mortgage. They got into a, a sale dispute with someone they had a contract to sell to for a certain price, and then 
because of the damage and the length of time that it took. Mm -hmm. um, by the time, you know, two or three years down the road, the real estate market, you know, went crazy. They couldn't get some financing. The debtor tried to terminate the contract. The buyer didn't want them to do that. They got into litigation. We filed the case and the contract for around $30 million from a couple of years ago. But we're soliciting, you know, bids right now and we're getting 43 and 44 and $45 million wow. for a property that subsequently really hasn't changed, but it just kind of illustrates, you know, how much different the market is in, in um, you know, the, this, it's an apartment complex. So there's lots of different types of properties, but, um, but it's raised some really interesting issues mm -hmm. on, you know, what breach of contract damages might be if, you know, that contract wasn't terminated pre-petition and, um, just some, some really interesting issues that I, I just don't feel like we saw that many of those cases, at least not in my area. Mm -hmm. Um, and then recently because of the way that the real estate market has just boomed, um, across uh, residential, commercial. Right, it's both. It's, it's everywhere. It's vacant land. It's um, it's different for all of those categories of property, but it's there for all of them. And so I feel like that's leading to some different issues popping up in, in real estate cases. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And that was the first analysis of the home. I think the public has a federal interest in the potential risk of the long term market and the state funds. A number of sort of middle strata and lower strata functionality spaces were trying to come to the fact that travel long term is a Yeah, that's interesting. For for mm -hmm. Diana and those on the Zoom, she was saying that they're actually in California seeing um, uh, hospitality spaces like travel lodges and things like that being purchased by the state and repurposed for low-income housing and things like that. So it's one of the, the positive silver linings, so right. to speak, that's kind of come out of that situation. But she raises another issue that I'm interested to see if Diana um, has had any experience with. She was saying the communal workspaces that were so big for so long um, as being an effective way, you know, to do that really kind of fell off when the pandemic hit and we no longer wanted to be communal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so there, she's involved in two bankruptcies right now for those sorts of spaces and is expecting that that trend may continue. Are you seeing anything like that? Yeah. So I, I actually have, um, a group that, um, before the, before the pandemic, um, solely focused on retail um, and acquiring properties around the country and, and managing them. Um, they had taken a former sports authority in downtown Chicago and turned it into office space right before the pandemic hit. Um, and they've been trying to um, do more of the co-working, you know, type of you know office space in that building. Um, versus, you know, what they had originally planned, which was to populate it with a few um, large tenants. Um, and they've had some limited success, I would say, uh, with the co-working. Um, you know, there's still a lot of people um, in co-working spaces that aren't going to their offices. Um, 
certainly uh, with the expectation that a lot of companies will downsize their office space, uh, I think it's expected that there will be an uptick in use of those sort of co-working uh, type spaces that you have with, with a Regis or WeWork. Uh, but so far, um, I have to say that it has not uh, proven to be true yet, uh, kind of remains to be seen. So as people do eventually go back to their offices, there's a lot of, I think, small companies that haven't gone back to the office. Some of the larger ones, you know, have, have brought most of their people back. Um, but uh, I think you know, renegotiating these leases, et cetera, it's going to be a while before we really see um, whether the co-working space becomes more uh, heavily used than it was in the past. Ladies, that's our time for this panel. I think this has been another excellent panel and trend today. I appreciate all three of you and, and what you did to prepare and, and bring this information for us. It's definitely something that's going to keep changing, so it'll be interesting to see um, if your crystal balls are accurate. <laughs> at the end of it. But let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, for uh, Diana and those of you on Zoom, thank you very much for joining us virtually today. It's nice that when we can't all travel in person, we at least have this option. So I hope that um, it's been easy for you to use and informative. Um, and we hope that we see all of you in person next time because it's, uh, it's nice to get to hug a neck and not just get to see on Zoom. Um, but thank you very much for attending and, um, and we hope to see you at the next conference. Um, for those of you who are still in the room and are gonna be joining us for lunch, I don't know if you noticed in the schedule, we have about an hour break right now before lunch is gonna start. That's going to allow um, the folks who need to set up our luncheon in here to get set up. So if everybody could um, vacate the room, we can do some networking outside in these common spaces. If you need to return a few phone calls or, or handle something, this would be a good opportunity for you to do that. Um, we did postpone our uh, Rising Star Award presentation uh, because that's a big deal. And we wanted the folks who are being recognized for that to have the chance to travel here and all be recognized. We felt like that um, would be preferable to trying to do a hybrid on Zoom. And so we're going to postpone that to the spring. So this luncheon is mostly and almost